Okay, let's step off into hour number three on this Monday night. Yoshi Shimatsu just emailed me a little while ago and said, I've lost my cell phone. He did. He said, it must have fallen out of my pocket when I went to the computer store and I'm looking, he's looking for it as we speak in Bangkok, Thailand or somewhere around there like crazy for his smartphone. He should know better. You're not supposed to ever put those in your pocket. They should always be held in the palm of your hand while you're awake. Remember that. Just look around you. If you don't believe me, you'll see. Never put them in your pocket. Well, anyway. So maybe he'll call in this half hour, hopefully. And if not, uh, we have a, a great lineup for you this hour. Dana Durnford is back. And in the second half hour, joining Dana and I will be Richard Wilcox from Tokyo. So Dr. Wilcox is standing by, and we'll get to him a little bit later. The last time we talked to Dana Durnford, he was, and if you know, Dana suffered a diving accident, and he is, uh, he is, well, he wears leg braces. You can call him a, a paraplegic if you want, but I call him a superman by any stretch of the imagination. He is one of the most brave, unique people on the planet. He was all alone on a 20-foot 21-foot Zodiac, that's a rubber boat with a top on it, in the wild winter weather offshore of wild British Columbia, doing his research, trying to find at low tide the ability to get near enough around the islands and so forth to see what the tide pools look like, to take photographs and samples of them. He has already established without any doubt more hard science than any publicly available scientists or government agency, either Canada or the U.S., I don't care whom, or anybody, than uh, anyone could or has. He is uh, a remarkable asset to all of us as a sentient species and a caring species. And uh, he was, uh, the last time we talked to him, also had gotten hit in the face and had suffered a, a serious shoulder injury of some kind. Now, I don't know what kind of a of a a situation he's in right now. We're going to find out. Can you hear me, Dana? How are you? Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. I'm probably in a hotel after nine weeks on that little dinky. And that's a long time when anybody's booked some sure, but it's a hell of a long time when you're getting pounded through storm after storm after storm. We've never seen that like this at this coastline. It's crazy. Um, Todd, Todd uh, could, uh, pull the phone away from you a little bit, Dana, a little bit further back. Yeah. Let's, try so, that a little bit better. Yeah, it's a, yeah, we're a little close there. Yeah, stay back from it. We had a good connection. You're nice and loud and clear. Okay. Um, well, I'm in a little tiny community. Go ahead. Yeah, well, what I was going to say was, uh, for those of you who have been with us following our Monday night Fukushima report, you know that Dana has been, I'm not exaggerating here, risking his life above and beyond the call of duty by a factor of a hundred at least out there to try to do things that the government probably is doing and is is well aware of, but they'll never tell us. That's their game. They don't talk. We don't know. We don't have the God-given right to know. We're being pounded by radioactivity on land, on shore, in the air, in the rain, uh, in the ocean mist along the coast, wherever you may live, there's something floating around in it. You can count on that. Uh, so thanks to citizen hero scientists like Dana Durnford, we have a clue. And his website, nuclearproctologist.com, dot org, dot com. Dot org, yeah. Dot org, I never get that right. Sure, Nuclearproctologist.org. One of the most unusual names for a website of activism <laughs> I've ever heard. Uh, but it fits, it fits the bill. Now, you're in a hotel. Tell us what's happened to you since the last time we talked. <laughs> that's, that's you have 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like I've been in a washing machine for nine weeks, basically. I'm just pounded myself. But, you know, I keep getting the data. I hooked up with the dive fleet up yeah, there. Yeah, pull, pull that phone dive. back. Pull that phone back. I don't know if I can pull it back much more. Um, right. I hooked up with the dive fleet on the north coast. Here. They're heading over to the Queen Charlotte's in a few weeks. Uh-huh. And so I'll have some safety. Uh, they'll keep an eye on me. 
make sure I get back into the anchorage each night, and I got someone to tie up to. Uh, uh-huh. It's huge. That's a huge. We don't need to go over there, but we got to go over there anyway. But uh, Turkey's entire coastline, it's way worse than Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island was totally annihilated, and it was just a handful of species. There's not even that up here. It's There's really not. Wait, wait, wait. The, D- Dana. There's less the further yes. north you've gone. Less. Yes, there's there's virtually Way nothing. Less. And on the west coast itself, I can tell right into the open ocean itself, less again. It's 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 just shocking. The the rocks are completely naked. It's like a river where the rocks are naked. Yeah. And there's a high tide zone for people that are not familiar with where there's just amazing amount of species. And then the low tide will have up to nine thousand six hundred that are recognized as residential critters on our coastline. Good Lord. All the institutions, and they're all, everything is completely missing. But the biggest thing, I think, for me was about a week ago, it really struck home how the mussels uh, were completely gone. And I'm working on that angle right now. And I'm going to go in at some point and, and really flush this out a lot better down the road here, but for folks who don't understand it, every rock, interior and exterior of the coastline, should be covered in mussels. And I don't know why that evaded me the way it did up till now, but it really sunk home about a week ago, and I was going through the pictures trying to put up a synopsis, and it struck me like a rock that there's not a single mussel. I can't find a mussel. And at least down on and I would find some little patches. And so what that turned into was I got into a bit of a debate with a few guys, and they said I was just another guy who learned how to suck money out of the government, and that's all I was up to. And who, said, wait, so who, like, said, oh, 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 who said yeah. that? Who said no, that? No, that was just people who, who were naive and didn't know better and took one look at the operation and said, oh, yeah, you're just another guy who's sucking money out of it. You won't, you won't do nothing. You won't say nothing. Right. And I said, for first off, and I don't know if I took it the right way, but for first off, I told him, I said, if you can go out there and find a patch of mussels, I'll find the boat and all that equipment over to you. And that shut him up right on the spot. That really, truly put him in their place. And, and they just dropped their guards. And they said, really? I said, yeah, really. You go find a patch of mussels, and I'll pay for the gas. You go get your boat, and I'll go fill it up at the gas station for you right now. I'll meet you there. And I said, I'll chase you out there. You show me the spot, I'll verify it. The boat is yours and all the equipment on it. And, of course, they never took me up on that offer, but they listened to me. Because one of them said to me, you know, I ate mussels a few years ago. And I said, well, you won't eat mussels anymore, sir. I was very polite with them, but I was adamant with them, too, that they can't get out there and find a mussel. If I can't find it, and, you know, I really, truly go the extra distance, if I can't find it, nobody is going to find that. And so I think I found my little window into each of these communities because I think that resonates for everybody on this coastline. Because everybody who grew up on the coastline would have went out at some point and got mussels off the shoreline and eat them. Because it, that is a tradition on this entire coastline. I see. I'm sure every other coastline, certainly, uh-huh. where it's Mother Nature. And I think that really, truly is going to change the game in the coming weeks. But uh, there is nothing left on the coastline. There's no flocks of birds anywhere. There's no insects. None. No. All right. All right. Now, how far right, how far north of Vancouver Island approximately are you, or were you at your your furthest penetration toward Alaska? Um, I was uh, 300 nautical miles north. Okay. Of, I think, yeah, 300. And it's it's actually observably getting worse the further north yeah. you go. And there's less population, less industry, in fact, no industry, mm-hmm. basically, mm-hmm. and just little tiny communities. The community is in the now is about 30 or 40 people, and it's totally isolated, and everything is naked, this, this whole complete area. I ran down the coastline to get low tides, because up north, the low tides were now till the 15th in the dark, and so I couldn't get into those low tide zones and get any good data out of that or underwater footage. Yeah, and so sure enough, I got daylight tides down here for the, that time frame. So I'll work down here for a week and a half, and like I say, nine weeks on the boat, and I just couldn't afford to 
burn money on a hotel room. I just wouldn't do it under no circumstances. And it come to the point where I got no option. After nine weeks, I couldn't even sleep last night. It was just so weird. And my, I got a hotel room. It's got no hot water in the shower, so I got a cold shower last night in the winter time. That's ridiculous. But, hey, that's what you get when you get in these little towns sometimes. You had, you had no hot water. No hot water. Get in the shower and then you can imagine after night. Well, I get showers at the fuel docks along the way. Yeah. But when you get a hotel room, that's the point of it. You get a long hot shower two or three in a row, and no, got <laughs> cold water. Uh, Which is okay. I survived. Well, that's it. That makes for a very quick shower. <laughs> yeah, that's another way of putting it. I guess. But it's such a relief. I said, I better call Jeff up because I know that you guys are trying to get a hold of me, but there's no way to get a hold of me when the weather breaks because I'm down on the ocean. There's no cell phone coverage. Yeah. Sure. So I reached out to you guys just to let you know that I was finally in cell phone range. Very good. I was surprised to actually get a cell phone range down here. I'm in the middle of nowhere, but hey, they're going to have the energy. whole they're going to have the whole planet covered uh, very soon. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not to worry. That. Uh, Google wants to deploy 80, I think it's 80, 80 satellites, something like that, to uh, Wi-Fi the entire planet, Google. So you yeah, can go anywhere on the planet, planet and be bathed in that wonderful uh, radiation. Yeah, and, yeah, but don't worry, you can get, you can hook up and get your text or sext message or whatever yeah. it is you want to get. So, yeah, That's all right. Now, how's your shoulder? Shoulder is actually really good. Still, in, I know better than to use it, but it's not an agony. It took about four days for the agony to go away, and I learned not to use that arm at all. Uh, but it's, at least it's not, it's not paining and aggravating me. I can use my stick and get around a little tiny Oh, bit. man. All right. But, uh, like I say, one arm bandit, got no legs, got one <laughs> you, You're operating <laughs> on one out of four uh, yeah. motive power yeah. sources. Uh, my so I gotta let that one heal up, and by the time that one heals up, the other one will give out, and it'll go back and forth like that forever, I'm sure. Well, um, let's let's not let's not go up. there. Shoulders are heal up. My knees are really really bad from the aluminum on the boat because mm -hmm. um, I put the aluminum cabin on the boat, and I have to use my knees up to get the shocks all the time to brace myself. So they're starting to give it. I mean, I'll come up with another solution for that one. Some All right, are you headed home right now, my friend? Or no, not? no, I changed plans. Uh, I was pretty worn out when I was talking to you last time. I was pretty depressed. I was pretty beaten down with the weather, and I had gotten the daylight scared out of me so many times by so many big waves and big seas and like that, and so many. I had you know, become demoralized. Uh, but I, I regained my common sense and just finished the trip and, and get it done, and then I don't have to do it no more. That's the, the outlook I got now is I'm going to finish the trip. Uh, I can't see myself stopping because I can't find anything, and so that frightens me every day. And then at night time I have to go through the data, and it just really, it, it stresses me out, Jeff, I think, because I understand significance of what I'm looking at, and I don't have anybody to talk to, and I don't have anybody to discuss it with, and I don't have any way, any outlet, you know, to get rid of it, and so, like, you're, being able to get on your radio show tonight is the first opportunity, since last time I talked to you, to get rid of some of that energy. Well, I, I, I was trying yeah. to think in my mind as the, looking at the in my mind's eye of the North Pacific from all the way across from Japan to our West Coast and how the North Pacific Current comes across and splits off Washington and, you know, I don't know, what a half of it just for discussion's sake goes north, the other half goes south down the, down the West Coast and then loops back across past Hawaii all the way to Asia and comes back up and makes a circle. Now, the part that goes north goes up where you are and into the Gulf of Alaska, but it doesn't have anywhere to go, and it just concentrates. Constant, am, am I right? Yeah, yeah, that's fact. So no, that's, that's exactly why there's, no, going on. there's nothing, that's, that's why there, there, there's, there's nothing there. Now, what are, the, what are the fishermen saying? Are they, what's their catch percent on, on the average? Are they, are they fishing? I, it's hard to find anybody. I mean, the weather is so bad. There's nobody really out there. 
And the ones that are out, they're, they're moving all the time, so you can't get a chance to talk to them. And I don't really see very many uh, boats, period. It's very really rare to see any boats. Um, because but, of the weather. I, well, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah, fish are further up the food chain, too. But the, there is, a, like you said, there would be a noticeable... Now, I do talk to some people, yeah, and they, they all tell me it's a disaster. It's another disaster. Okay, I, no, I this is interesting. With a large number of fish okay. You've talked to some, and they say it's a disaster. What do they say is a disaster, and do they know why it's a disaster? What yeah, do they that's say? Right. They don't get it. They don't get it. They just say it's a bad year. Ah, okay. They think about getting out of that, and it's just year. The last couple of years is bad. And but they, they, you know, I think what's going on is because is, it's really weird not to see anything out here, any boats out here working. You don't see. There's nothing out there, uh, and that's really odd. All you see is the tugboats going up and down the coastline with the commercial construction. Uh-huh. But you're not really seeing any fishermen. You're not running into anybody, not even sports fishermen. You're not running into anybody out there. Uh, and once again, the weather is atrocious. It's just unbelievable seas, and you really don't expect to see many people out there. And a lot of times I am certainly the only person out there that I know of. In fact, I know when I was last up to Dry Fleet, uh, a couple of different days, I was the only person out there. They didn't even go out there yet. I managed to go out. Because what I'm doing is different than what they're doing, but I was able to get out there and hide away. And they're targeting right now sea urchins. We talked about that a, a little bit last time, I remember correctly. Sure. And I guess sea urchins are further up the food chain, but they, they tell me that they don't see the sea urchins eating kelp. And they know that is really bizarre, but they don't understand the radiation side of it. And I only had a little time with them. Now, when I go back, up in about a week's time, week and a half time, when I head back up north, I'll meet up with them again, and they're, they're, they're already acclimated a little bit to me now, and now they're starting to ask questions among themselves, I would imagine. Uh-huh. And so now when I go back, hopefully I'll get some real questions, and I'll give them some cameras is the plan, and let them take the cameras down, and get some real different footage from the divers. Uh, perspective. Uh, very good. What did what did they say? Did they say anything at all about the population numbers of sea urchins on the well, bottom? Yeah, I mean, they do. Yeah, they. That's something I heard. They they asked me. You know, a number of them have come up and talked to me out of the blue and said, "Do you think that the missing species out here has got something to do with the radiation?" And I said, "Well, that's my opinion. Yes, I do believe it does." And the other will come up and ask you, do you think the kelp that are missing got something to do with the radiation? And I say, yeah, that's probably what's going on in my opinion. And a number of them have come up and said, the starfish are missing because of the radiation, right? Not because of some disease. They say, that's a lie, right? And I say, yeah, that's my opinion, too. And so it looks like people are really... Oh, they're catching on. It's it's, uh, taking hold, and that's it. And now that they got the extra piece of the puzzle, which was the radiation, because they didn't understand that, but they did look into it. And the the people that own this local area here, uh, just before dark, I was down checked on the boat, and they gave me a ride in a little tiny golf cart cart to get there. This place got no automobiles. But they gave me a ride back and had a quick chat with me, and they, they were like, I knew it. When they realized what I was doing, when they asked me, and they were, they were like, see, I knew there was something going on here. And I just couldn't put my finger on it. But he said, as soon as you opened your mouth and started talking, he said, I, I knew what I was thinking was right. So he was, he knew in his own mind, he said, he's been following it ever since it happened. And he's been seeing it, but he said, there's, there are people here when you try to talk to them, you can't talk to them because they don't see it. And, and some of them even say, so what? And he said, so it was really frustrating. He said, but, he said, yourself, I'm able to have a conversation with you. He said, it actually resonates. And he didn't say those words, but you can tell that it all resonated with him. He got really excited because it actually made sense for him. He said, now I get it. Now I actually understand it. Because that's the point of it. These people are isolated. No one talks to them, and they don't know what's going on, but what's ha- why it's happening. But they, they, they fear it's probably the radiation from Fukushima. So it does seem like the majority of people are aware, yet some are not aware. Uh, but the majority seems to be aware, and the majority immediately, of course, uh, accuses the government of lies and cover-up uh-huh. and manipulation. Uh-huh. And so that's, that's encouraging to see. But once again, when it's blowing rain sideways, when it's gale force winds, storm after storm, 
um, not many people are really having conversations, you know, or many people are <laughs> chatting to strangers on the side of the road. So that's what I mean. It's not like a sunny day where people are, are chatty and want to have a chat. It's just horrible, unimaginable weather day after day. And I'm stuck on the boat for myself. People don't even know if I'm, I'm on the boat because they're not even there themselves. And so then I'm gone the minute the weather breaks. And when I say the weather breaks is that it looks like it's going to come down, so I'll start plowing my way out and try to get two or three days in and before it comes back up again. So I'll head out even though it's still rough because I know it's coming down. Uh-huh. And so I'll take a beat and then I'll, when it gets rough, I'll take a beat and on the way back if I Jeez. can get back. It's, and a lot of times i got to raft up in the island and tie on the trees and sit it out. And i got some really bad stuff up there at the end of it before I moved down here because I was working in the dark, right up to the dark, and then I had to find my way back in the shelter in the dark each night. And it's a different anchor each, each night. So it's a you know, logistic nightmare. Right but of course, you know, the GPS and stuff like that, the radars and the sounders, that the technology we have today makes all the difference. Yeah. And if that goes down, though, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I can tell you. When you, when you, uh, you, you, you tie up on, on some of these islands, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah, now, to a tree. Yeah. yeah. So you actually just float up along the edge and, and I guess, do you get out and, uh. So I got a zodiac on the roof and, I'll turn a little zodiac in the water, I'll go up and I'll drop two anchors, uh-huh. and I'll steam backwards, and I'll drag them till they're really tight. Jeez, Dana. And then, yeah, and then I'll go ashore with the little zodiac, and I'll put up two beach lines, and then different trees, in case one gives out on me from different angles, and then I'll, I'll, I'm pinned down for, <laughs> I'm pinned down for the night, and, and a lot it, of times I'll, I'll leave a Scotchman and, uh, uh, mark around that in the morning so I can come uh-huh. back at the end of the day and tie up to it again. And there's no one on these islands. They're basically Nobody deserted. anywhere to be seen, no. no. No lights to be seen for hundreds of more. And they're, they're, they're beautiful islands. Incredible. That's incredible uh, country up there. But now South they're South. sitting in a dead ocean. Yes, sir. Indeed. All I right. Mean, that's really good, sir. Hold on, Dana, if you would. We'll come right back in just a couple minutes. Uh, the amazing Dana Durnford, live from somewhere up there in the wilds of the Pacific Ocean off the British Columbia coast. Okay, and welcome back. Talking to Dana Dunford. Dana, another uh, question or two. It's winter. It's not the time you'd be out looking for insects and bugs. But this spring and uh, and early summer all along the B.C. coast is, is probably going to tell the tale for a lot of people. We'll stay on this. You'll stay on this. And it's, it's a question of an entire die-off, not of one species, but of thousands of species, all interconnected, all interrelated, all dependent upon one another for life, liberty, and the pursuit of whatever it is they're after. So they have they have fallen on, shall we say, hard times to the extent that, as Dana told us months and months ago, driving up the coast, he didn't have to clean his windshield. There were no bugs to speak of on the front end of the truck. None. This doesn't happen. What do you expect uh, this summer then, Dana? Yeah, that was quite a shock last year to see that. And the revelation itself uh, was stunning and scary, to say the least. And so this year I'm ready for it. And in in one sense, I'm trying to, this year I'm going to really go after the data at all the gas stations. And sure, so that's that's a great there. that's a great idea. Perfect place to meet travelers, compare notes from all over the place. Right, I mean, hit all those motorhomes with big, beautiful, shiny, wonderful looking motorhomes that are perfect on the front. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know what you should do if you can is take uh, obviously take a video camera of some kind and and just interview these people and just talk yeah, to that's them. That's what I gotta be. That's what I gotta learn to do. I gotta learn to do that. Of course, in bad weather, it's impossible. But in good weather. I got, yeah. That's why I definitely want to focus on more for the documentaries. I need a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right? Different yeah, sure. Different communities. 
And so I'm willing to do that, but right now I'm really set up in the conditions and the weather and the environment just for the low tide zones. But like you say, that's a different scenario altogether, much more palatable for that kind of routine. Yeah. And I yeah. would love to, I would love to encounter people. But the way I encounter people is so random now and so yeah. that you well, I understand. That opportunity. Now, I'm definitely planning on following that. Okay. Let's uh, go over to Tokyo right now. And bring Dr. Richard Wilcox, Ph.D., on. Uh, Professor, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Hello, How Dana and Jeff. Hi, it's Good. yes. Say, say hello to Dana. Thank you. Hi, Dana. Nice to meet you for the first yes. time. Great Good to meet you. you. Thank you. Just off. Glad to, glad to hear you. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I got it. We're all, we're good. How, uh, how is, uh, how's merry old Tokyo, how's Tokyo? Richard? <laughs> Uh, that's, it's, uh, it's fine. Uh, I'm fine and thanks for asking and, uh, I was li- just listening to your, uh, fascinating, I don't know if Dana can hear me very well, but, uh, his fascinating, uh, 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 descriptions of his, um, you know, of his diving experiences and, uh, yeah. of his research, so, and, uh, it's very interesting. So, well, he's Thanks out alone on these on. islands, and he's tying up his yeah. his big boat, and then takes a little boat and t- goes in and ties it to a tree. And there's no one out there. There's how many islands are there, Dana? Twenty six thousand. Twenty six thousand beautiful uninhabited <laughs> islands up there. Can yeah, you imagine if if they happen to be located <laughs> down this way? I would have tried to buy one long ago. Get the hell away from everybody. Yeah. Peace and solitude, and that would be just wonderful. I, right. And I was looking at the photographs. At his uh, nuclear proctologist. He has a uh, you know so many incredible photographs. Yeah. Uh, could you ask him? Are he those can, he can hear you, Richard. He can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Dana. Are those starfish uh, deformed? Or I'm very ignorant about you know about Wait, the yeah. biology of these. The pictures of this the starfish, starfish are, are this, is that evidence water. of deformation or what? Okay, yeah, go ahead, Dan, answer. Just about all the starfish that I see out of the water are deformed or dying or melted or petrified in, in, in one sense. Uh, none of them looks healthy, yeah. and a lot of them might be deformed, uh, like heavily deformed, and obviously deformity. I know that some of the great color ones will show up really well in deformity where you see like 16 legs on a five-leg starfish. You're, you've seen that? 16 yeah, legs on really a five? Yeah, that's really pictures, too. Just wow. Just really incredible pictures of that stuff. Uh, but you're not seeing Because I'm looking at... Uh, it's a top picture, January 10th, Spicer Island, Wait, and that one totally looks right. weird. I mean, that's like that's right out one. of a Schwarzenegger science fiction it movie. <laughs> That, that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about uh, think... go visit uh, folks please stop by you can click on Dana's name uh, on rents yeah. or just remember nuclearproctologist.org and all the pictures are there alright Richard your next question yeah. or yeah. comment well uh, and I was just relating I mean if these are genetic deformities from the radiation then uh, we know already from the research from Tim Mousseau in, uh, who did extensive research in Chernobyl, and then now uh, in Fukushima Prefecture, he's done research in the uh, terrestrial on land of uh, of insects and uh, you know right. uh, those life forms, and so there, that's been documented in the scientific literature already that because they generate so rapidly the uh, deformations in the genetic. Yeah, but we're talking, uh, uh, Richard, you know, about yeah. a complete so, absence of insects, which yes, was, was I know apparent that too, right? this, this, yeah, right. last year, last summer, and uh, this next yep, summer. I, I know. Yeah. No, I mean, I know it's horrible. It's unbelievable. The whole story is just incredible. And you, but you go well, up to and anybody. Every day you go, you learn about a new die-off uh, of some yeah. species or another in the Pacific Ocean, and there's yeah. something going on here. Well, yeah. that's what the scientists say. There's something going on here, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, I, the yeah, excuses are getting to be ridiculous. Go ahead. I just wrote a paper, which is going to keep James busy. It's about ten pages, but I'm, uh, it deals with. Uh, 
the nuclear apologists, uh, Kai Vetter and Dave Cullen, and I mentioned Dana's work, <laughs> and, um, and uh, awesome. uh, you know, I'm just kind of interested what your opinion of, you know, everybody will be able to read my paper in a, in a while. But, yeah, we'll uh, have it up what's tonight your opinion uh, of this on Jay, the site. Jay Cullen. Jay Cullen fellow, he, he seems to be a covering up uh, for the, the cause. Well, he came out of nowhere, he didn't he? He's a marine chemist at the University of Victoria in uh -huh. British Columbia on yeah. Vancouver Island. He got a $630,000 hush fund to go around to the community yep. and, and give them a presentation about radiation, that it was benign and innocuous like uh, potato chips and bananas walking in sunshine routine. And so obviously right. he's way down the rabbit hole, and he's been confronted a few yep. times, and uh, he's always claimed that that information is misleading and it's not true that he presented with uh, when, you know, I can't uh, Photoshop a thousand pictures a day and stuff like that. And why would I anyway when I get yeah. a GPS and they can go back and, and then uh, discredit me? Why would I do something like that? And, but he he yes, says that you exactly Photoshop all these photos on your... That's what he allegedly Incredible. said uh, and does email yeah. before forwarded to me. He said this in, in uh, exchanges. Uh, but he's also, every time someone brings up any other kind of information about uh, radiation in North America, now, I mean, Canada, uh, there's a headline, a famous headline of Canada, Health Canada says 300 times iodine uh, compared to background radiation is minute. It was uh, minuscule, it was insignificant. And as you know, for the iodine 131 and 300 times it, this is a man-made against bananas. This is what the comparison was. But it just goes to show how much actually showed up here. There had to be 10 times more iodine 132. There had to be 30 times more iodine 133. And there was 31 times more iodine 129 with a 15 million year half life that was ionized and radiated to the chain reaction that also had to show up at the same time because that's how it worked. And so Jay Collin will keep referring to iodine 131 with an 8 day half life. And so people just become complacent. So An eight-day eight eight day half life. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, but he doesn't mention the 132 or the 133. Yeah, there are over 200, at least 200 radionuclides that we should be concerned about that no one ever talks about. Right. Well, there, it recently in uh, Japan, even a Japanese-run scientific study uh, pointed out that the food, uh, that the measuring mechanism of the government is underestimating or not even measuring the strontium in Japanese content of food whereas cesium is is a uh, tract but strontium is being underestimated and so it must be much worse in the ocean where it's much more difficult to measure right. they spray salt water on those reactors and the salt water created the sulfur hydrogen uh, peroxide buckyballs and that was able to ingest the atoms with the isotopes and they become like little nuclear engines and not soluble in water and so a lot of that strontium was picked up through that venue, that vector, and when that's transported across, it's very easy to transport that stuff because it's so tiny. It's much smaller than the pollution that comes across from mm -hmm. Asia all the time, mm -hmm. and so it comes to the same venue. Uh, that stuff, you know, it's hard to, to recognize it because it's in those buckyballs, and so it's hard to recognize the buckyball. I don't even know if we've got the technology... But, but there was 1,500 right. of these sulfur buckyballs per cubic meter of beer in California in March and April uh, by um, uh, UC Berkeley, I think it was, identified that. 1,500 atoms, radioactive atoms from Fukushima in a cubic meter of beer. And so people were breathing these hot particles, these hot flea, fuel fleas each day. And so we're really going to see the damage show up from that. Uh, Dr. Ray McGill made a from Loveless uh, Respiratory Research Institute, and all they done was took beagle puppies and dogs and fed them plutonium and americium-241 for 35 years, and they showed that even the smallest amount with uh, animals would get cancer in three, four years, about 70% of them would die from it. Oh, and yeah. So we expect to see that die-off now over the next year and two years really show up in, in the mammal and the human population. All the other populations seem to be died or gone. Yeah. And uh, that's really stunning to see 
you know, there is 9,600 recognized species that are residential to the coastline in the tidal pools themselves, and I can't find them anywhere on this entire coastline since August of last year, and that's why the trip has never stopped, it's because of, to me, there's no more urgency imaginable than trying to, to bring a conclusion to what the damage really was and to verify for everybody with the actual documentation. And so that's why it was taking so much time, energy, and effort and monetary, but that'll be done in a few months, and then what? Hopefully, you know, people like yourself who are so articulate. I've read a lot of your stuff, by the way, and I do appreciate it. I, oh, thank I you. know how, how much work you put into your, your material and uh, how many people covered that. And so that's huge to have someone like yourself on our side that is actually really, truly going down that rabbit hole and is able to discern it out to people properly the way you do it. That's, that's huge. Yeah, Richard has made a very big contribution you, to our, our knowledge base. We're, we're coming up on four years, and cancer is going yep. to most probably begin to project uh, into the media one way or the other. They'll try and dodge it for as long as they can, and they'll get away with it for a few years. But uh, four or five, six, seven years, you're going to start seeing people with compromised or weak immunological systems uh, beginning to get sick from cancer. We sure, all get cancer, cool. but our immune systems can take care of it in most cases, and Things are uh, tragically going to get bad for children. Uh, this is this is really a crime. It's a crime of immeasurable proportion. The native communities here just are ravaged with cancer. They're ravaged right now. This is, every time I hear someone talk about the native communities, they talk about cancer. It's going to just start again, and that's what they always say to us again, again, you know, cancer again, brutal cancers over and over and over, and just weird cancers. And bizarre cancers you've never heard of before, huh. and blood cancers, leukemia, and just a lot of it showing up. You know, and, and I've seen pictures from, from Japan, Richard, of these uh, yeah. farmers holding up these grotesquely deformed common vegetables and oh, yeah. laughing and laughing about it. Like, isn't that, isn't that funny? Ha, ha, ha. Uh, they're laughing at their own demise is what they're laughing at. Yeah, I haven't seen any of those recently, but right for quite a long time, yeah. there was a, a lot of those photographs, uh, like Fukushima Diary especially, was, uh, and it's been a while. So that's one reason I asked Dana about those starfish. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, cancers, I, in the paper I just quoted, uh, actually Yoichi is the one that put me onto this quote uh, this information, but the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War estimated that uh, 430,000 cancer deaths by the year 2000 would have occurred due to the uh, uh, A-bomb test, you know. And so uh, that's, I mean, and that's, now we have Fukushima mixed in with all that. So, uh, I mean, it's just incredible. And this is a huge cover-up, of course. I mean, there's no acknowledgement in the mainstream media about the about a group like an independent group independent from the united nations uh these physicians that's not a small number and of course there's other estimates that are much much higher than four hundred thousand but uh it's just i mean you throw fukushima into the mix and it's just worse it's a nightmare dana what's your uh what's your plan then for the next um i guess you're going to go out another month on this Yes, I'm going to do a couple of weeks right here, and then, because the tide, like I said, I came to one of the nautical miles down the coastline over the last two days to catch the tide, uh, because it's dark up on the other end, but then I'll head back up into the Queen Charlotte Islands, that's the cover, that's the biggest hit we can do, is the Queen Charlotte Islands, and that's around 350 kilometers long, I'll do both sides of it, I'll be running with the commercial dive uh, fleet at the same time. And the idea is once we do all of that, it's okay to head back down uh, after that. But that's, I'm not going to go anywhere until I get to Charlotte and, uh, and done. But then in the spring, I want to head out to the Northwest Territory and do the Beaufort and the Baltic Sea, the Northwest Passage, and see how much of that stuff is coming down our back door and surrounding this continent. And that has to be done in my opinion, in order to get that whole picture. And I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can. I'm pretty worn out. By the time I get home, I don't know if I ever want to move again out of the house. 
but I would imagine there's nothing going to stop me, to tell you the truth, because I can't imagine stopping. And Is, so much energy in yeah. time went in putting well, this together. Where, right. Go ahead, where Richard. are the other researchers to help? Where are the other research to help Dana? This is incredible. I mean, where's National Geographic or Oh, you got to be scientists? kidding. They, they There's just, one guy <laughs> doing all this work? That's right. There's one guy doing all this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, not gonna going to happen. On? It's not it's not going to happen. They're all tied up to the government. They're tied up to a corporation. They're tied they're tied. They're in they're part of the um the matrix. So, it's, it's not going to happen. Themselves. They can't step out of line, see? Or the roof will come down on their heads. That's right. So we're we're not expecting that until it gets to uh, the point where there's nothing left along the west coast. Nobody catches any fish. No seals. No sea lions. The whales, if there are, there'll be a few. Remember, there are no baby orcas left. Uh, they've all died at one year or less since 311. They're at the top of the food chain. They're eating the most radioactive yeah. fish, and uh, they're paying. The, they're gone. Uh, so that's it. That's it. We'll find out eventually when when the cancer rates in, in our species uh, start to go through the roof. What's going on in Japan? You know, you've got cancer there, but sure. is it being hushed up? Or are they talking about it at all? Yeah. Well, you know, the the uh, the newspapers aren't really publishing much about the the, the nuclear issue anymore. They're they're and, afraid uh, because of the law. Yeah, and they're controlled. And, um, uh, I mean, the Asahi Shimbun, I just, uh, one of my students actually gave a very good presentation. I must be a good teacher. <laughs> but it was about a comparison between Minamata disease, which happened in the 1950s, in Fukushima. They compared those. And it's the same bloody thing. Uh, it was a big cover-up. They, they poured, uh, Chiso Corporation poured mercury right into the ocean. And, uh, the diseases spread among people and animals, and it was years and years uh, before uh, anybody would acknowledge the cause of that. And the Atahi Shimbun was one of the papers that uh, was part of the cover-up. And I mean, the Asahi Shimbun is one of the better papers, actually. But and I think it's the same this time. Uh, it's very hard to get, you know, uh, systematic analysis or good information about uh, the cancer rates in. Fukushima or elsewhere, and um, when they do publish that kind of information, it's you know they go by the UN, uh, UN skier. Um, they they just kind of quote them and say, well everything's okay, and this number of thyroid uh, abnormalities in children is normal and everything, but when it's not at all. So uh, we have to sort through the little information that leaks out. You have to. There was some. Uh, Somebody on ENE News, a woman who uh, spoke at a conference that's on YouTube, and she had a lot of interesting things to say about the rising cancer rate. Um, and what I found really interesting was the attitude of the people uh, that she know. She's a Japanese woman, and she uh, said, "It's just what my own experience is about the way people uh, are in denial, and you're not supposed to break the harmony of happy." People's happy attitudes and talk about such depressing things as cancer or or anything. Oh yeah, that goes so let's celebrate. Uh, so. Let's celebrate and encourage denial and ignorance. That's all. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. Really wonderful. And she she expressed it. As I thought exactly. I've seen I see that all the time, and it's so frustrating. It um, is. Her relatives would you know kind of get angry with her if she. Spoke about yeah, okay, R Richard, you have uh, you have a wife and family, Japanese wife, and you have uh, family, children. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. you yes. if you didn't yeah. if you didn't, I'm assuming you would have resigned and gotten out of there. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. I mean, when the accident happened, I I did suggest we leave, and uh, but my wife is a very stubborn person and didn't want to leave and. Um, I was terrified for the first, you know, uh, few right. weeks of that, of the, of the ongoing. And then, uh, as, that's one of the things that provoked me to, to write about the topic, to learn more about it. Right. Uh, and as I learned more about it, I got a little bit of handle on it. But where we live, um, we're just a little bit outside the danger zone, really. But, you know, we've talked about this before. It's bioaccumulation through water and food that's the. Of course. The thing that worries yeah. us. So, 
I do well, listen, try to do uh, the we're best just of that, just about out of yeah, time here. Yeah. You you've sent the paper over. Uh, we'll have it up uh, loaded yep. in the in the night news batch. It'll be in the top Fukushima Great. section. What's the title of it? Uh, it's called uh, "Captured Opposition Defends Nuclear Poisoning." Very good, good title. Okay, uh, I Richard. Hope it's a good title. It's an excellent title. Uh, thank you so much again for everything. Capital E. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, and your contributions again, uh, extraordinary. Because we just don't get the news out of Japan at all, uh, unless it's from you. Uh, there's no one else, so you're it. That's right. Thank you, okay, my friend. I'm it, and thank you, Jeff, and thank you, right. Dana, and I hope to talk to you again soon, Dana. Take yeah, care. you too. Anytime at all. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Okay. Sure. All righty. Bye, bye, guys. Good night, Richard. Uh, Dana, you've uh, worked your way down the coast a couple hundred nautical miles. You're uh, you're going to do what? Then just hang out in the island, try and do yeah. as many islands as you can. And the best I'm going to go do all the leading islands that lead to the inside. So oh, all yeah. the flow of water that has to come in inside has to go through a group of islands. Uh huh. So I'll always try to hit those first. Very good. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks for being available tonight, Dana. Take care of yourself. A lot of people are thinking about you. You know, sir. Thank you. Okay. Take care, folks. Good night. Okay, there's uh, our report. And Yochi has emailed me. He found his cell phone. So I'm going to put him on this Friday night, same time. He has some uh, very unusual things to talk about in addition to this. So he'll be with us this Friday and then again next Monday. Okay. That's Monday. We're off and running in the second week of February. Have a good night, and we'll talk tomorrow.